archives. associates that I ran that with one were interested in mining properties and so I was their lead man out in front of the field. And I had made contacts in Wickenburg, Arizona with a man that knew this area and told me of the potential of it. And so after dealing with him for several months, I found he was just leading me on oh a merry chase to see how much money he could bleed out of me. And the one place that I really believed that he had that was worth investigating was in Golder Canyon. And since I have found that uh, possibly this is right, but it still needs more work done to prove it to a financial business asset. So in the first week of March of this year, 1969, I came to Golder Canyon and came to the Barker Ranch with the other man that was with me by the name of Bob Barry. Now, he had been in here, in this canyon, in December of 1968, and he saw all of these girls. And uh, being the type that he was, well, he wanted to come back because he figured that he could come back and have himself a little pleasure at their expense. And so I know at this time that that was his real motive for coming back. But my motive for coming here was to see if I couldn't make this a profitable business adventure. So on the night that I arrived, I met Brooks Poston and Juanita Wildbush, or Joan Wildbush. And uh, they were living in the big house on the ranch. And we talked to them for a while. And uh, then uh, Bob said he would go, and we would go and stay in the cabin that was just to the left of the house as you face the ranch. In the days that followed, I became <clears throat> more acquainted with these people, and every day, <clears throat> this Bob Barry and myself would go walking across the hills, and we would go and inspect old mine sites, old diggings. We would bring uh, samples of ore down. We would crush these samples of ore and pan them and check them out for their contents of this yellow metal that we were looking for called gold. And in the meantime, <clears throat> Bob's attentions were becoming more directed at this Juanita Wildbush. But at first he thought she was the most stupid woman that he had ever met in his life, that she was completely ignorant, she didn't have any sense whatsoever. In a sense, he had developed what might be called a hate for her. And uh, being that I had been watching human nature for many years, I figured that this was one way that he was tying himself up that he didn't even realize what he was doing. But I figured if that's what he wanted to do, that was his business. So I would go with him over the mountains, and the first three weeks we were there, I would surmise that we had walked approximately 250 or 300 miles over the hills of Golor Canyon, back down into Wingate Wash, over into the Panamint Range, back down on the other side, on the other side to what is called the January Jones Mines, which is a very difficult place to go. We went to a place called the Crescent Mine, the Panamint Queen. I had, had gone through all of the workings of all the hills around there, and it's impressive to see the amount of work that has been done in this area. As the time went on, we began to filter out the places that seemed possible good prospects and those that weren't. And we finally settled down to some places that uh, looked like they were pretty good, and so we went to work carrying ore down the mountains to run sample tests and all of this. And some of it looked good, some of it didn't look too good, and we kept working and working and working. In the meantime, when we would come in the evenings, Brooks and Juanita we would sit in the evenings and talk, and we began to learn and hear about Charlie. And I couldn't believe what they were saying. I mean, it was uh, so utterly ridiculous that uh, I thought they were just talking. I thought they were nuts, that uh, 
no man could possibly be doing the things that he was talking about. And so I paid very little of attention to it. So they seemed so afraid of this Charlie that I implanted them with the idea that I had the power to keep Charlie from coming back up there. And so they accepted this idea. And so poor old Charlie, later on in his ventures, tried to come back every time he would try to come up there. So he told me later that uh, he would try to come and the truck would blow up and wouldn't go or the police would stop him and arrest him. And uh, it was all my fault that I was some kind of a big deity sitting up on the hill that was trying to keep him from doing what he had to do for all the people of the world and that I was in his way. And uh, we had one boy named Paul Watkins that had gone to town a couple of times and he had told Charlie this. And so Charlie didn't know who I was, but he had heard of me. And so I was already a threat to him. And so this is one of the reasons why he wanted to kill me, because I was in his way. And in the meantime, as we went along, I got Brooks to go and work with me to get him out of the lethargy state, as I call it, that he was in, to get him to climb mountains, to do things, to build his physical body back up to where that he could be a man again. And then one of the other boys came, this Paul Watkins came, and he decided to quit Charlie and come and go with me too because it was that I made more sense to them than he did, and I could explain to them what Charlie was doing, that it was ridiculous, it was idiotic, that it had no value whatsoever to them. And so by this time, I had already stolen Charlie's top man or one of his men that he considered one of his good men because he was able to participate better than anybody else in the sex act. And so he didn't like this at all. I had stolen this Paul Watkins because he was supposed to be a good fucker, as the word was put around. I had stolen Brooks Poston, and then later on, another one of the guys that he'd been trying to capture came up, and he wanted to know if he could stay with me, too, because he didn't have any place to go because they had busted, by this time, they had busted Spawn's ranch. And so by this time, I had stolen from him in his mind three of his men. And so he was very angry with me. He had never seen me. He didn't know who I was. But I must be some kind of big medicine because people were leaving him to go with me, more or less to speak. And so I was using these men to pack ore off of the mountain. And the guy that was bringing me supplies was bringing extra supplies so I could feed them. And so his first idea when he came to the top of what is called Golar Wash or to the Barker Ranch, his, he told me a few days later that, uh, did you know that I had planned to kill you? And I said, yes, I knew you'd planned to kill me because of the way you acted. And then a couple of days later, a couple of the girls came up to me and told me, did you know that Charlie was going to kill you? And I said, well, he told me he had planned to do so. And <clears throat> so by this time, I had figured <clears throat> that I had best make myself valuable to this man or he would kill me. So he wanted to know how it was that I got Brooks and Paul and Juan to quit him and to go with me, because he knew that he had the power to get people to do anything that he wanted to once he got them, but what he was more interested in was, how did I get undo what he had already done to them? So, <clears throat> this Charlie, we're referring now to this one, one Flynn, who worked at Spawn's Ranch, and who also had worked with movie producers in producing many movies, not many, but he'd worked on a couple, and he had just come back from Montana, Las Vegas, and some other places where they had filmed a first-rate movie with first-rate first -rate actors, which I'm not at, uh, well, I don't know who they are just at the moment, but I can find the names for you if it's necessary. And uh, that uh, when he went back to Spawn's Ranch after he filmed the movie, he was there, when the police came down in their helicopters and uh, 
the whole works when they made the big bust there and confiscated all of Charlie's material, as he called it, that was his, that he had worked for two years to put together. This was approximately a month and a half or two, two months ago from this date, which is October the 3rd, 1969. And so this is what they called the big bust when uh, they went into Spahn's ranch and took uh, him and all these people to jail. Now, Juan was very perturbed because he hadn't done anything. He didn't know what it was all about. And he was mad at the law for taking him in and putting him to jail because he hadn't done anything. And so he came up and uh, at this point he could have very easily been swung to go with this Charlie. Because uh, now he was mad at them because they threw him in jail with all the rest of those people. And so I talked to him and I <clears throat> would like to impress on your mind the fact that Charlie had threatened his life in the presence of me and Brooks both, several times, and that if you don't go with me, Charlie said, then I'll kill you. And Juan is a veteran of Vietnam, from what he tells me, and that he saw plenty of killing and did plenty of killing, and that he is not going to let this Charles run over him. And I would personally consider that I had talked him out of killing Charlie a couple of times because the man is not dangerous, but he was provoked and provoked and provoked and provoked and provoked until I could hardly blame him if he did. Because this guy would grab him around the neck by the hair of the head, stick the point of a knife to his throat, and says, Do you give up? And he was trying to impress upon the man that what he should do was everything that Charlie wanted him to do. Anywhere from murder, rape, stealing automobiles to go and do anything he wanted him to do. And this Juan did not want to do and was not going to do. And he would, he would tell me in kind of uh, symbols that he would do what he had to do if this guy didn't leave him alone. But he never came out and openly said that he would kill him. But I know that that's what he meant. And so if Juan... He will be coming back into Golder Canyon in a few days. And he went out to find another place for us to live to where we could work until these guys were apprehended by the law or whatever happened because it just wasn't safe up there because this guy was getting wilder and wilder and wilder. And so Juan will be coming back up with some papers to where we could go to a place... In the High Sierra. So this place in the, <clears throat> in the High Sierra was, was a little town called Alantia. And we were going to go there until this whole thing blew over, until Charlie was apprehended, or whatever was necessary to get him out of where we were working, so that uh, we could uh, go back and continue our work. And <clears throat> so it is of my opinion that if you, he will probably be coming in on the Ballarat Road or through that area there. So if you can stop this man and not let him back in there, but <clears throat> to keep him from going back in there, because I'm of the opinion that Charlie, if he finds anything a little bit out of line or anything else, that it will wind up one or the other of them. Because this one Flynn is not going to take any more from him. He took about enough. For At this moment, uh, Brooks Poston is going to cite some of the songs that we heard and that he has heard that Charlie writes and programs his people with. One song is called, Your Home is Where You're Happy. And the verses are, Your home is where you're happy, it's not where you're not free. Uh, your home is where you can be what you are because you were just born to be. So burn all your bridges, leave the past behind, and burn all your bridges in something about the mind there. I'm not sure about that line. There's one called The Insane Train, and he says, I hear the train a-coming, it's coming around the bend. I ain't seen no sadness since I can't remember when, since I can't remember when. And then they sing on and on about, I can't remember when my mother told me to shut up and get on out of here. I can't remember when they told me to shut the bathroom door, stupid. I can't remember when, I can't remember when. 
I can't remember as part of the program that he uses or what he says is a program that he says unprograms what you've already been computed. One of the songs has a line in it about the only thing you know is what they've told you, the only thing you know is what they said, and the only thing you know is what they've told you, that all that was true and real was dead, and several other lines that follow that that lead you to think that he's the one that can, the only one that can show you the way out of all the games, as he calls it. He has one song that he's written for motorcycle people that tell him to ride and hide away on the desert, like the wind you to ride with his hair long and flowing, and it goes on and on about hiding on the desert, and he wants to get people to hide out there. And he's tried to get people to promote his records, but so far he's been unable to get anyone to produce them and put them on the market. As far as I know, from what he said, he wants to use the dune buggies he has, and at one time I hear he had a machine gun, and he wanted to use them in a Rommel, Eric Rommel-type venture. And he said Hitler was a tuned-in guy like himself, and that he saw the truth, and he leveled the karma of a lot of people. Karma is what he calls uh, sin or something like that. I guess he equates it with sin. Now, I've just completed talking to you about uh, this one, Juan Flynn. Now, he's about six foot five or six foot six. He's a tall, blonde-headed man. He came from Panama. And he's uh, got the most beautiful body on him that you've ever seen. I mean, he's physically perfect. If you've ever seen a physically perfect man, I think you would agree that at least he's a nice-looking man. And he has light hair and uh, blue eyes. And he's uh, Castilian Spanish. And so coming in this Ballarat way, if you can keep him out of there, I think it would be well worth your time and ours too. Now there's one other man, his name is Paul Watkins. Now evidently he was going to come back by the Warm Springs Road. And so I would appreciate it if you could keep him from going in too because he doesn't know that we have left. And neither does the one Flynn know that we have left. So if you can keep him out of this, I think that it would be better for all concerned because they have already expressed their desires and their wishes to be completely separate from Charles Manson or whatever his name is because they have been able to see that he is nuts, he's crazy as a loon and that this is my personal opinion, but I think that from all the tapes that we are making here, that there should be some substantiation to what we say. And so, at this time, I'll change the subject to another subject called uh, armament and his relation to it and what he has talked about doing. Now, whether he has done it or not, I don't know. But he's talked about having dune squads or dune buggy squads in the desert to where he could plant dune buggies every 10 or 15 miles over Death Valley so that when you guys come in after him that all he has to do is to walk over a hill or a ridge or then three or four miles to another location where he has food stashed out, water stashed out, gasoline stashed out. He has one wing tank off of an airplane, which is a 300-gallon gas tank, he has several 40, 50, and 60-gallon gas tanks of many different descriptions placed all over the desert that uh, they have disappeared. I have seen them at the bottom of Gola Wash, but I don't know where they are located now. He has talked about seven vehicles that he has that he has brought in. And so he's got them scattered around the desert. A man that is used to walking in the desert can walk approximately 20 or 30 miles in, say, a 5 or 10 hour stretch if he really gets after it. And this man is on uh, LSD or on any type of dope, could walk 10 or 15 or 20 miles in less than 3 or 4 hours. Pick up a new dune buggy or where he had one stashed and hit out and be gone to the other end of the desert before you knew he was even out of the area. And so he has programmed all of his people to the extent that they're just like him. He has put all kind of things in their head. I didn't believe it could be done, but he's done it. And I see it working. And I had him around me 
for about three weeks. I've never met the man until just about three weeks or three and a half weeks ago. But from what I see and what I see coming into the desert, I don't see how in the hell he's getting it other than the fact that these people are doing it for him because he does nothing himself. He doesn't do anything that could pin anything on him. So the only way we can stop this man is to be able to catch him in a vehicle that he is driving that is hot or do or catch him in some situation to where he has become deadly or something like that because he is a very clever man. He borders on genius. And yet he's so idiotic, it's, it's ridiculous, but you can't overlook the fact that he is doing what he's doing. And he's doing it, and you guys should know best that he is doing it because you're trying to put the make on him. So all of these things he told me about being in jail where the black Muslims and this and that and the other that he has heard through other cells speaking of having a case of... Uh, Grenades, another man talked about having a bazooka with three rounds that he was going to make his count. Other people were talking about having browning automatics, about all types of uh, sellers with uh, cases of uh, ammunition, piles of stores and stores of all kinds of things, Molotov cocktails. I've heard some of the weirdest stories. I thought it was all make-believe to start with, but I'm of the opinion now that if you could check jail records and such as that, as when he was in jail, who were the black men that were in jail with him at the time that all this was taking place, that it might pay to check in to see who they were and put tails on them or whatever is necessary because he says the black man is getting ready to blow the whole thing open that he talks to them, that they know him, that they tell him these things. And all this is to me, to this point, is hearsay. But of the other things that have come into my consciousness since I've met the man, uh, not all of it is hearsay because things are happening.